Hello and welcome back to An Old Man Watches, where today I will be talking about the 1972-ish Spanish offering Fury of the Wolfman. While on an expedition to Tibet, uh, Valdemar Doninsky is bitten by a yeti. An example of the kind of logic that will predominate in this film, that experience turns him into a werewolf, because, you know, yetis and werewolves are basically the same thing, right? Uh, fortunately, Doninsky is a scientist, uh, in this movie, that is. Uh, more on that later. Uh, he is studying the effects of certain emissions on the human brain, and he hopes to use his technology to control his condition. Unfortunately for Doninsky, his research partner has far more sinister and, believe it or not, even less plausible plans for their work together. Doninsky's efforts soon founder uh, on an unexpected crisis, however. He discovers that his wife is having an affair with one of his students. When his wife's lover not only cuckolds him, but also tries to murder him, Doninsky wolfs out, and in his bestial, furious and furry form, he slaughters them both. Or so he believes. Upon recovering his humanity and his senses, Doninsky is naturally horrified by what he has done. Uh, he is, in fact, unable to live with the guilt of his actions and the risk that he might commit further such crimes. So he commits suicide by electrocuting himself to death. But we all know that werewolves are kind of hard to kill, so if you expect this to be the end of Doninsky and the movie, you're out of luck. Uh, this film has a whole lot more runtime and a whole lot more absurdity left to unfold before the credits finally roll. Fury of the Wolfman was written by star Paul Nashi under his birth name of Jacinto Molina Alvarez. Uh, it had something of a troubled production. Uh, Nashi's friend Enrique Lopez Iguiles was originally scheduled to work as director, uh, but after completing only one sequence, a, a sort of nightmare dream, uh, he departed the production. If Nashi is to believe, the replacement director, Jose Maria Zabalza, was a lazy alcoholic, and as a result, this film wound up including a lot of stock footage to pad out its running time as well as some carelessly mismatched werewolf scenes played by an anonymous stunt double that the director hired without informing Nashi. Now, how much of all that is true in terms of the backstage information, I don't know. Uh, obviously, Nashi was a very invested and involved and biased person, and this is only his version of events. But what I do know is that the film does use a lot of stock footage, and it has numerous technical flaws. It's not well shot, um, for instance, uh, and its poor quality is recognised at the time. It struggled to find a distributor. Uh, and in fact, although made in 1970, it was not released in 1972. Hence me saying it's the 1972-ish movie. Now, I can confirm that the reluctance to distribute this movie was well-founded. It is a bad film. But it's flawed in some interesting and novel ways, so let's talk about some of them. The first thing you should know about Fury of the Wolfman is it is the fourth, or possibly fifth, or possibly first, or possibly some other number of no fewer than 12 films about Voldemort Doninsky. Uh, the confusion over this movie's placement in the series stems from a couple of different factors. First, there's the tangle of real-world production woes. It was the fourth Doninsky film to be made, but due to delays in finding a distributor, it was the fifth to be released. The wonderfully tacky-sounding The Werewolf vs. The Vampire Woman was produced and made it to screens before this one finally limped into cinemas two years after it was con uh, filmed. And then there are the in-fiction conundrums that further complicate the matter of order. This film establishes Daninsky as both married and a scientist, neither of which had been true in the three films that came out before it, and it also presents him as first being infected and becoming a werewolf rather than already suffering from the condition which he did in the other films. Is this a prequel so botched even George Lucas would have disavowed it? Perhaps, or perhaps not, because continuity in this series was more rubbery than that of classic Doctor Who or even of classic Doctor Who monsters, for that matter. For instance, in 1975, Nashi would star in The Werewolf and the Yeti, uh, a film in which Doninsky travels to Tibet, is captured, bitten, infected by a pair of werewolf women, and then battles a Yeti. How does that hang together with what happens in this movie? Well, in short, it doesn't. Uh, the next time your favourite franchise makes a continuity gaffe, spare a thought for 70s audiences trying to keep all of this straight. So, as I noted, Doninsky electrocutes himself uh, in this movie, but werewolves are hard to kill. Uh, it's not a silver bullet that is needed here, however. Instead, the movie tells us that werewolves can only truly die at the hand of the woman they love. Which, like the three rules of owning a mogwai, uh, is a kind of seemingly simple statement that quickly breaks down when you start thinking about it in any detail. 
what is love? Uh, does only sexual and romantic love count? Or could a werewolf be killed by his sister or his daughter or his mother? Is platonic non-sexual affection between friends a form of love? What if you have a pet and it's female? People say they love their pets, after all. And all this is before we even step into the realms of gender identity and sexual orientation. Are gay male werewolves functionally immortal? What about asexual and aromantic werewolves of any gender? Now, obviously, the 1970s were a very different time, and these weren't questions that would have even occurred to Nashi as he wrote the script. But it's the kind of thing that, you know, these days I'd be thinking about. So does the script actually have a reason for issuing the uh, the usual silver bullet in favour of the only love is lethal vulnerability? Well, yes, it, it actually does. Uh, it's a rather clumsily handled reason, but a reason nonetheless. You see, as I may have kind of given away earlier, it emerges that Janinsky's wife isn't quite as dead as he thought she was. And it's not just Yeti who can turn a human into a werewolf. In the short term, however, Janinsky isn't really dead. That's what's important, which means his research partner is able to revive him. Uh, she's an ex-lover of his, as well as his colleague, but her not motives for resuscitating him are not at all benign. They are, however, deliriously absurd. You see, Dr. Wolfstein, yes, that's really her name, wants to add Daninsky to the army of mutants she is breeding in her castle. Because, of course, she has a castle. She intends to release these creatures to cause havoc and prove her power. Now, you might hear that plan and say, well, uh, it's, it's pretty weak, but it seems fairly generic evil scientist scheme. How is it deliriously absurd? Well, you see, Dr. Wolfstein wants to harness Daninsky's werewolf strength for her aims, but she knows that he's not a naturally violent or wicked man. He's not going to carry out her orders of his own free will. So to get him to cooperate, she zaps him with her mind control ray. Yeah, this genius has a mind control ray, and the best evil plan she can come up with is uh, make some mutants and unleash them or something, I guess? Uh, it seems to me that having the ability to control the actions of others would be a much more effective and harder to trace form of villainy, but then it wouldn't lead to clumsily executed werewolf on werewolf fisticuffs, so that's probably why she doesn't do it. Fury of the Wolfman fully deserves its shoddy reputation. You can safely skip it, uh, though I have to admit I am a little bit tempted to seek out some of the other better regarded films from the series to see how they compare. Maybe one day you'll hear my thoughts on Werewolf versus the Vampire Woman. Don't hold your breath, though. Next time, uh, the Mogwai reference was a bit of a hint. Uh, Tis the season, after all, so let's check out that famous Christmas movie, Gremlins. But that's next time. Until then, thanks for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you've seen today's movie, let me know what you thought of it.